Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Congressman Golden's listening session focusing on the impacts of the coronavirus on Maine small businesses. Um, if you have comments or questions you'd like to share with the congressman or one of our guests throughout the call, please dial star three at any time. Um, at the end of the call, everyone will have the opportunity to leave a message for the congressman, and our office will make sure to get back to you as soon as possible with a response. Um, if you do ask a question, we ask that you keep your question short and to the point so we can hear from as many people as possible. I'll uh, turn it right over to Congressman Golden now. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, and I want to thank you all for joining the call tonight and taking time out of your evening uh, to speak with us. I don't need to tell all of you that these are challenging times for the state and for the country. I know that small businesses are feeling the economic impacts of the coronavirus crisis and having to make what is sometimes often feels like impossible choices. And the next few months are certainly going to continue to be very tough for many, many of us, many small businesses and, and many people in the community. Uh, it must feel like there are often more questions than answers for small businesses right now. It's hard enough to manage a business without this uh, chaotic environment that we're in uh, and one that has come upon us so suddenly and, and unexpectedly, which is why we wanted to hold this event tonight. Uh, I'm here to listen. We're all here to listen. Uh, the people joining me on the line uh, and myself will do our best to answer your questions and provide helpful information. We may not be able to answer every question uh, right this moment, but if we can't, uh, myself and my staff are going to be making uh, notes and we will follow up with you to make sure we get you the best information possible. Uh, tonight, we're lucky to have several guests with us who are going to lend us their expertise and their knowledge. Uh, Amy Bassett, the director of the Maine Small Business Administration. Uh, Amy, uh, just pause very quickly uh, on behalf of, of everyone in, in Maine, but also the people on the line. Thank you very much to yourself uh, and your staff at the Small Business Administration uh, for the hard work that you're doing, uh, the long hours and, and the just incredible effort. Uh, to try and, and make a, a positive difference here and, and to help uh, businesses here in Maine. We really appreciate it. Uh, we're also joined by Dana Connors, the President and CEO of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce, Todd Mason, President of the Maine Credit Union League, and Chris Pinkham, President of the Maine Bankers Association. I want to thank each of them for joining us. We're all focused on helping small businesses weather the storm, and a big part of that work is clearly connecting small businesses with the federal resources that Congress has made available under emergency legislation passed uh, in just the last couple of weeks. Among the most important provisions, I'm sure for many of you that you want to talk about, the Paycheck Protection Program, often referred to now as uh, PPP, as well as the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. Many small business owners uh, out there uh, on the line uh, could very well uh, already be familiar with these programs, already be underway with the process of applying or waiting to hear back. Maybe some of you have actually heard back and are wondering about uh, how to uh, stay within the uh, guidelines for, for keeping them forgivable. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into the specifics on the call uh, as we go uh, forward with your questions, so I'm not going to get into the depth of, of those details right now. Uh, I do, however, want to point out that at my website, golden.house.gov, We've put a pretty comprehensive guide uh, to these and other programs to help small businesses uh, get some information about how they can address uh, some of these issues. And we've put that together working uh, with the Small Business Committee staff uh, as, as well as uh, my staff working uh, with many uh, uh, people from the agencies that we have on the line tonight. Uh, and with that, we'll turn it over to some of our experts to kick us off uh, before we start taking questions. Great. Um, Amy, would you mind, would you go ahead? Thank you. Pardon me? Was that directed to me? I'm sorry, this is Dana. Uh, uh, Director Bassett, if you would go ahead, that'd be great. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Golden, for hosting this session and for inviting me. I'm honored to join you and these my distinguished colleagues. Um, our team at the SBA in Maine has been extremely committed to helping Maine small businesses and our partners gain access to information and um, help roll out some of these really important tools that are now available through the federal government um, to assist businesses at this time. 
when we look back, this really kind of started for us back in early March, and things have just cascaded really quickly. Um, we had tremendous support throughout the state from our lending partners, the, the folks at the governor's office and all of our staff from the um, congressional office as well. And I think Maine is fortunate in that everyone is working together and everyone as usually we do, but everyone is extra committed to working together to make these programs work the best we can for all the small businesses in Maine. I've worked for the federal government for a very long time and never in my career have I seen programs of this magnitude uh, get up and running so quickly. So it has truly been an honor to be part of those efforts and we are going to remain committed until uh, this is all said and done uh, because we know small businesses are really struggling out there. So I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And before uh, we hear from Dana, I just want to point out uh, for those of you on the line, and, and I think you know, Director Bassett uh, and I both probably believe that uh, for those people who are feeling anxiety and, and maybe frustrated with the rollout of things right now, uh, we don't offer excuses. We just want to uh, take your feedback and, and do better. Uh, but just hitting the pause button here very quickly, the, the PPP, uh, something that was drafted in about a week's time, starting in the Senate, uh, passed 12 days ago. Uh, SBA has been building the plane while bringing it down the runway and taking it off, rolling out in one week's time uh, a platform for starting to receive applications. And uh, I think it was Chris uh, with us tonight uh, from Maine uh, Bankers Association who said that they had received word uh, that one of their clients has received distribution of funds today, Wednesday. That's 12 days. Uh, since passage of this law that created this new program um, with a lot of money uh, that we hope uh, to see uh, coming into Maine to help a lot of small businesses. So very impressive, uh, Amy, and, and thanks again to, to you and, and all, the, all the folks at Maine SBA for doing the very best you can. Thanks, Congressman. Uh, Mr. Connors, please feel free to go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. I, too, want to add words uh, to what Amy has so well stated, and to thank you, Congressman Golden, for the opportunity to join with Director Bassett and our two friends from that very important lending community, both the banking um, as well as the credit unions. Um, I do want to echo your sentiments. I, I, I say this on behalf of the entire chamber family in the state of Maine because uh, we are a family, but I can think of no better example in my experience of 25 years that we have come together as one and tried to provide the type of resources and information on each of our websites and every opportunity that we get. And I would also acknowledge that when you think of it was early March when we first learned of the coronavirus and its impact on Maine in terms of both the our lives as well as our livelihood, and think about in less than a month what has occurred, how people have stepped up at all levels of government as well as the private sector, that we really are a family in the state of Maine, and there's no better example, no, no better way to express that than to look back in terms of what has happened and how we have come together. It is true that in there with... 800 pages of a bill uh, that has been presented in such a short time and with two very important uh, loan programs that affect the small business community. Indeed, there are questions, there is some concern and confusion, and this opportunity, I can't thank you enough to bring together the business community with, uh, with the SBA, uh, our banking family, as well as the chamber family, to be able to hear of the concerns but also to help in any way we can. We thank you for that. We look forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Connors. Um, and with that, we'll, uh, we'll move on to questions. Um, I'd like to remind everyone on the line that if you have questions at any time throughout the call or just comments for, um, uh, for the good of the order, you can dial star three at any time and you'll be connected with um, someone on our staff to, um, to ask a, a question to the line. 
Um, we'll go to a question that someone submitted online. Sarah from Old Town asks, I've heard money is running out for the PPP program, that's the Paycheck, Paycheck Protection Program. What does that mean for my small business if I haven't been approved yet? And is Congress going to give the program more money? So, uh, you know, I will, um, you know, do my best to um, take uh, questions that obviously, uh, like this one, uh, reside in Congress uh, with follow-up questions, I think, between uh, Amy and um, Dana, Todd, you know, Chris, and myself, we'll be able to figure out who might best be able to answer them. Um, I'll speak right now to the prospects of more money for the program in Congress. Uh, and if if Director Bassett has any insight at all into what where the program stands in regards to um, the original uh, monies put forward, uh, I think roughly 300 and. Uh, Sixty billion dollars, and and how much of that has already been? I mean, I think for a lot of people, they're hearing things like, you know, dollar figures applied for uh, versus approved versus distributed. Uh, but in regards to if you've applied, you haven't heard back, you're worried that there's not enough money uh, in the program right now, and and will Congress do more? Uh, this, uh, the treasurer, uh, secretary of the treasury, has uh, working with the president's administration has. You've probably seen gone to Congress and requested more uh, money for the program. They've asked for $250 billion uh, in additional funding. Um, and I, I, I don't want to over, uh, I don't want to, um, I don't want to guarantee that it will happen, but I think that it is quite likely that we will see at least that much more into the program uh, and that we should see that happen quite quickly. I know that leaders have been calling for unanimous consent from the Senate and the House for this, although I have heard um, quite recently that there may already be some objections to a unanimous consent agreement, uh, which would be required to, to do this as quickly as possible. And so in the absence of that, uh, we may have to establish a quorum uh, in the House anyway, and uh, some of us would have to go down to Washington uh, to um, to support its passage. I have high confidence if that took place, uh, the, the votes would be there to do this. People realize, I think, the stakes for small businesses all, all over the country. I, I wouldn't hesitate to go down there and support it myself, having done so uh, just a, a little under two weeks ago myself uh, when I went down to, to vote on the $2 trillion pack, uh, package in the House. Uh, so I think things look good. Uh, I will say that I personally uh, just today sent a letter to leaders uh, in Congress to share with them my concerns that even an additional $250 billion may not be enough to meet the actual demand, uh, even within the confines of, of the program running through uh, June 30th uh, of this year. I've seen some estimates from some, uh, I think, sometimes considered conservative uh, groups like uh, the American Enterprise Institute saying that they think the real demand among the small business community could be as high as a trillion dollars, uh, and so if we were to do just 250, I think if, if they're anywhere near right, then we would still be uh, short by quite a bit. Um, so I think Congress needs to stay focused and be getting feedback from the lenders and SBA and the business community so that we can make sure that we are trying to meet the demand. Thanks, Congressman. Um, We'll go to a question from Denise, who wrote into our uh, online portal. We applied for an EIDL, I believe that's uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loan. How long will it take to hear back, and how long to receive the payment? What financial criteria would exclude a business from receiving this loan or grant? From Denise. Amy, Amy do you want to try and take that one? Sure, no problem. Um, so this program um, became effective back on March 17th, when the, that was when the official disaster declaration was received. And Maine was extremely fortunate that um, the governor and her team was able to quickly gather the necessary information and get it in. And Maine was actually the first state in the country declared a disaster and making Maine the first state eligible for economic injury disaster loans. So at the beginning, we were uh, having 
great success with some uh, prompt service and things, but then quickly, as things I mentioned, cascaded. Uh, by the end of that week, every single state in the nation had received these declarations, and it became uh, very evident that it was just a, a huge influx of loan applications and inquiries. Um, they have um, revised the online portal, and I want to make sure anybody listening that if you applied very early on and did not reapply, um, the advice is to go back in and reapply because the online portal now asks, it's very streamlined, asks, asks for a lot less information, and it also will enable the applicant to check a box so that you can be considered potentially for the economic disaster loan advance. And those advances could potentially uh, be up to $10,000 and potentially a portion of that could be forgiven as well. So we want to make sure that anybody who didn't apply in that avenue did. Um, uh, my team has been fielding calls for a long time uh, since this all started looking for uh, when folks might get an answer. And I know that people are desperate and I know that people need the money um, and we unfortunately don't have access directly to the system ourselves, but we do are providing whatever support we can to get answers from their customer service. But a, a, a good number, I apologize, I didn't have a chance to uh, grab the data, but last time I looked, we had close to 100 economic injury disaster loans approved in Maine, so they are getting through the system. Um, and I know with this new online portal, things are going to be sped up. Um, it is a loan. Um, we heard that early on that people were concerned. There is a certain level of lending criteria, but it is uh, generous uh, because we know people do not need a lot of extra added debt. We know that businesses are struggling and can't pay additional debt. So as far as the lending criteria, SBA has really tried to be as lenient as we possibly can while still being a good steward of the federal dollars. Thank you, Director Bassett. And you know, something I've been, uh, um, I had heard, and, and I thought it might be helpful for people, maybe if you could uh, confirm. Um, I had heard that with the EIDL program, that if a business applies for that loan, uh, and is approved that they have quite a period of time uh, to choose whether or not they even want to take that loan out, um, and that if they chose not to, it would, there'd be no uh, financial penalty and there is no fee to apply. Um, you know, so some people may consider applying, uh, but then waiting to see, uh, you know, where they're at um, and how things go in the next couple of weeks. Uh, is that accurate? Uh, do you know how long people have to decide if once they've a loan has been approved, uh, you know, how long might they be able to just kind of wait and, and see before deciding whether or not they actually want to accept the loan? That's a terrific point because um, there is a lot of flexibility there. So once that business is approved for the loan, they actually have up to six months to make that decision before they have to actually have the loan dispersed. So they have six months from the date of approval to make that decision. They can also decide they may want to take less. Um, the collateral requirements and all these kinds of things are a little bit less stringent for the smaller loan amounts, uh, so the businesses have that flexibility. And you are correct. There's absolutely no cost to the applicant to apply. And then additionally, if they do take the loan and the funds are dispersed, those loans start with an immediate 12-month deferment of payments. So again, SBA is recognizing that these businesses, it could take quite a while for people to recover, and we don't want that extra loan payment to hamper that. So once that loan closes, the business would not make an initial payment for 12 months after the loan is closed. Thanks, Director Bassett. Uh, I want to remind uh, folks who just joined the call that if you have a question um, or a comment, we would love to hear from you. Please dial star three at any time to ask your question. Uh, we'll go now to another online question from Jack in Greenville. Jack asks, which banks and credit unions are currently participating in the PPP? Where can the general public find a list? So 
I'm going to open this one up to everyone because I have a feeling like there might be multiple places where people could go for that information. I don't know if we want to start uh, maybe with Chris and, and Todd, and then I'm sure the SBA has some feedback as well. Thank you, Congressman. This is Chris Pinkham from the Maine Bankers Association. There are 30 retail banks in Maine, and as of this afternoon, 27 of them uh, are currently accepting applications and enrolled in the program. Um, I would suggest that if um, Jack, who raised this question, uh, has a relationship uh, with a bank or a credit union, um, he would be advised to go directly to them first. Um, there's a real advantage if there's a relationship that's already been determined, and particularly if they're a credit customer, uh, that expedites the process. Congressman, this, well, this is, is Todd uh, Mason. Dana. Okay, go ahead, Todd. Uh, hello, this is Todd Mason, president of the Maine Credit Union League, and I want to echo uh, Chris's comments. Um, please uh, check with your credit union or your bank first. Um, that's, uh, they have your best interest uh, at heart, and uh, they are just a, a first good resource uh, to go to. Um, we have uh, 55 credit unions in Maine, and as of today, I believe we had uh, just about half uh, that are supporting uh, the Triple P program. And importantly, and I know this is uh, working in a similar fashion for, our, for the banks, uh, new uh, financial institutions, new credit unions are being added to, to that list on a, on a regular basis. So please check with your credit union, please check with your bank. This is uh, Dana Connors with the Maine State Chamber of Commerce. And um, adding to what has already been said, there is no question that if you have a relationship, you go to your lending uh, agency. But in addition, if you want to find out a list of those currently, as well as we keep them up to date, you can go to the uh, State Chamber's website, which is mainchamber.org. That's mainchamber.org. And you'll also find links to your local regional chamber, which they also provide uh, for those within their region. Thanks, everyone. If I could just, oh, go yeah. for it. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Will, if I could just add on there. Um, we have been completely advising everyone to start with their local lending institution because um, before this even started, we were working with banks and credit unions, and this is across the board. Um, many banks deal with us and many credit unions deal with us on a regular basis, but even those that don't, we're wanting to know how to sign up. So we worked really hard in advance of the rollout and we still are trying to assist those banks that aren't as familiar with us because we know they want to be able to offer these loans to their customers. So um, really it's gonna be almost every single lending institution in Maine that ends up working with us, I think, on this. Thanks, Director Bassett. Uh, we're going to go to our phone lines now. Uh, we've got Laura from Lisbon Falls. Laura, go ahead. Hi, I have a question. I am uh, a sole proprietor of a small business, um, a children's consignment shop. Am I eligible for any type of funding or unemployment being self-employed with no employees? Thank you, Laura, for that question. And uh, I think maybe... Um, anyone can try and answer this one, but Amy, you might be um, in the best position. Sure. So um, as a small business owner, um, you know, you do have the option of both programs, um, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan or the Paycheck Protection Program. I think what we're seeing since the PPP has rolled out is that a lot of businesses are looking there to see what could be covered and be eligible there because if um, the most you can do with that is payroll expenses, then there's a, a tremendous benefit in that loan forgiveness piece. Um, and what we're trying to remind folks, because there's, again, a lot of information out there, but what the PPP program was really designed for is to help businesses survive and to keep their workers paid. So when these businesses uh, need that immediate cash flow help, 
this program is really what could be very beneficial. So just because you own your own business, um, you're still an employee of that business. So you could still qualify for a PPP loan. Um, if that, you know, there were other needs that may not be met by that program, you could certainly be eligible for the economic injury disaster loan as well. But we are seeing a lot of businesses um, really trying to fully explore the opportunity to take advantage of the PPP program at this point. Thanks, Director Bassett. Um, we will go back to our online questions here. Carrie asks, is the EIDL loan open to 501C6 organizations? I have heard yes and no to this question. Yeah, and I, um, we have heard this question come up a lot. Uh, this isn't a new question for us. And because normally with SBA loan programs, it, my team and I deal with on a regular basis, SBA loan programs are not open to nonprofits. So economic injury disaster loans are, as well as uh, certain um, nonprofits under the PPP. But specifically to the economic injury disaster loan, um, we have been provided guidance that for certain private nonprofits are eligible, um, but there are certain designations um, that we are working to get clarification on, um, and it's it's really tied to what those designations are, um, versus a 501c3 versus a 501c6. Um, so I apologize if that has been confusing. Um, we've tried to work really hard to get that clearly stated, but I'd be happy to work through the congressman's office and we could follow up individually with this person if that might help in the future. Thank you for that. And um, we, we'd be more than happy to take down uh, your information uh, to the caller asking the question uh, so that my staff could, could coordinate getting you a response uh, as soon as uh, the um, SBA uh, is able to, to clarify that for, for the main SBA. Yeah, could I add uh, to that, Congressman, and uh, for Amy's benefit as well? Here in Maine, um, we have probably 60 local and regional chambers, and even though they, they are all classified as 501c6s, and they have been led to believe that they are eligible under the Economic Injury Disaster Program, but that confusion that you spoke of has put them in a very awkward place because their lobbying is minimal. Uh, most of their work is outside that. So it, it is something that if you could provide for us that information, that clarification, it would serve all of uh, our chamber community here in the state and probably a lot of other states as well that are operating this. So I would ask that as a favor, please. Sure, and you know, if it was up to me, I'd help everybody, <laughs> but there are the rules, and this, again, is a program that's driven out of headquarters, but again, I would be happy to coordinate with anybody to, to get a clear and definitive answer. I, I cannot promise that it will be a good answer, but I promise that we will get a clear and definitive answer. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We're going to go now to um, Dale in, uh, in Penobscot County. Dale, go ahead. Dale, are you with us? Uh, yes, I'm in Brewer. Uh, a question about the uh, PPP. We have been um, approved but I'm led to believe by our lender that we need to rehire our entire staff immediately upon closing. That means that there's seven of my staff members I've let go for the time being, uh, keeping only two so we can do urgent care only. Uh, question is, can I just simply bring these employees back as we need them, as mandates are lifted, 
or do I have to uh, hire the entire staff back? Director Bassett, I don't know if you have uh, clarity on that. I mean, my, my understanding is that this was meant to preserve uh, people's uh, paychecks, and even for those businesses deemed non-essential uh, that are eligible for this, that they would put people back on payroll, but that didn't necessarily mean they actually had to come in um, and perform uh, the, the work if, if it goes against the guidance for uh, social distancing from the uh, governor's administration. But could you perhaps tell us what you know? Sure, absolutely. This question comes up a lot. So because um, in order to qualify for loan forgiveness, at least 75% of that loan must be used for payroll costs. Um, and there is a requirement that once that loan closes, there are up to eight weeks to utilize those loan funds for payroll costs. Uh, we do recognize that many businesses will remain closed due to no fault of their own. Um, we've heard from folks that, you know, sometimes the people don't want to come back. Um, but that is the way the program was designed. So, and it is that those funds do need to meet the payroll costs. So, if it needs to be an adjustment to the loan amount, that could be an option. But, um, again, the intent of the program really was to get wages back into the hands of the employees um, and so that the small business owners didn't have to. Um, there are, um, you know, as I mentioned, I've, uh, this was a, you know, $350 billion program that rolled out in a week. And there have been more fine-tuning details that have been coming out along the way. And I'm sure there will be more to come. Um, so certainly, Stay tuned to the congressman's website and also um, the SBA website or the Treasury Department website. It's our hope that they'll come out with some additional tools or guidance to really make it easier for businesses and their trusted advisors to give them some guidance exactly on how to meet the criteria so that they can maximize the benefit of the loan forgiveness. Thanks, Director Bassett. We're going to go now to Linda up in Van Buren. Linda, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Hi, we, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, about that 75% um, that we have to keep our employees, um, like I'm a, I open in March and I close in October. And the number of employees this year are less than last year because of the coronavirus. So is there an exemption for businesses like mine? So I would say that, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, you may adjust the borrowing amount. And again, you can get the loan and it can be used for other certain purposes, but people are just very focused on the loan forgiveness piece. Um, so those are the criteria that we just mentioned for the loan forgiveness piece. But let's say that perhaps the whole loan cannot be forgiven. And then when that portion of the loan that could not be forgiven converts to a term loan, uh, those rates on that loan are extremely favorable. So that loan that cannot be forgiven becomes a term loan with a fixed interest rate of 1%. Uh, it's a two-year note. There is no payment due for the first six months, and there's no personal guarantees and no collaterals required on those loans. Um, there's no fees to the borrowers, and there is also no prepayment penalties if um, the business does want to pay that off. So I know, and I certainly understand why people would want to max, maximize that loan forgiveness, but I did want to be sure that we talked about what if it couldn't all be forgiven, what might that look like too? Thanks, Director Bassett. I'd like to remind anyone who joined the call recently that if you have a question, we would love to hear from you. Please dial star three at any time and uh, we'll get you up on the air. Uh, we're going to go now to Patrice on the coast. Patrice, go ahead. 
Uh, hi, this is Patrice McCarran. I'm with the Maine Lobstermen's Association, and I had two um, specific questions that I've been getting from um, some harvesters. Um, number one, sole proprietors are eligible to apply April 3rd, and self-employed are eligible to apply April 10th. A lot of them consider themselves both. I was just curious what the criteria is, how you distinguish sole proprietor from self-employed. And then the follow-up question is, if a self-employed person runs and manages their business through a personal checking account, so they don't hold a business account with a bank, are they still eligible? Because we've had people who have been told that they don't have a business account at the bank, that they're not eligible. Thank you. Sure. So on your first question, I think some of the um, confusion there is, yes, sole proprietors, which is um, a person doing business as, uh, are eligible to apply now. And I'm encouraging everybody to get their applications in, even those that um, are falling under the, it's what that other criteria really is. And I hate to start rattling on about government forms, but um, those are employees who are not paid regularly through their employer. Um, oftentimes these are contract, they could be deemed contract employees. They may be paid on a 1099. And I think we need to, um, I've been on a couple calls today and I know this is causing some confusion, but those um, employees, so if, if employees are paid with the 1099, that payroll cost cannot be included for a small business, but the 1099 person is deemed their own independent contractor, independent business for the purposes of the way this program is delivered. And so that is the, the group that has that little bit of a delay in the uh, ability to apply. But um, we hope, um, and I have made note of this today, that we need to be providing a little more clarity around, you know, uh, because oftentimes these people don't think of themselves as a business, and so we need to help them with that kind of thinking that through. And then as regards with the checking account, um, you know, every bank has embraced this, but, um, you know, ultimately it's that bank or credit union's decision, you know, how they're going to sort of put some criteria on this. And while, you know, um, it doesn't necessarily... Uh, mean anything that someone doesn't have a commercial checking account to me, you know, there may be some process within the bank that they may need to do something a little bit differently. But the other thing we have come across is that um, a lot of small businesses may not really have a good handle on their payroll records or what is needed in that regard. And I want to make sure, and I know the congressman is a big fan of the Maine Small Business Development Center, as well as our other resource partners, SCORE, and the Women's Business Centers at CEI. But I would all strongly suggest that anybody kind of needing a little help with these applications or figuring out the process, reach out to one of the SBA resource partners, because they can be really helpful in helping the small business put this together regardless, and they offer their services at no charge. Thank you for, for that, uh, Director Bassett. This is uh, Congressman Golden, just following up on that. Uh, you know, having worked on legislation to reauthorize uh, the small business development uh, centers, uh, I, I just wanted to, to follow up on that. It's something my staff has been directing uh, people calling uh, to do as well. There are 11 small business development centers in Maine 2nd Congressional District alone, uh, and th those are free uh, services to business owners. Uh, if you call and you want help filling out an application for the EIDL or for the PPP program, they will help you and they won't charge you. I'm sure that they're experiencing an increased load uh, in terms of, of uh, calls from business owners, uh, and, and they have you know only so many staff, but uh, um, they will do everything they can to assist you. And uh, I think they're going to be more important than ever in, in the months ahead as we deal with the economic fallout from uh, the coronavirus. And, and also, Patrice, I just wanted to say hello. Uh, thanks for, for calling in uh, with your questions, and thanks as well for helping to get information out to all of our lobstermen. Uh, and we've appreciated getting feedback uh, from, from you, your organization, and, and directly from all the lobstermen as we were uh, talking about how Congress should be responding 
on thinking more uh, broadly about all, all the fisheries across the, the country as part of uh, the response package. So thank you. And Patrice, before you leave, this is Chris Pinkham from the Maine Bankers. I would suggest that um, your members and others should not think of, if they look at their checking account and presume because it's a certain type of account that might not make them eligible, they shouldn't assume that. This is a perfect opportunity for them to reach out to their bank or credit union and talk to the loan officer about how they might be served. I think we're learning today that with the date of the 10th coming up for the uh, official kickoff date, we're starting to get more inquiries. So I would really urge people to contact their lender and make sure uh, before they presume that they might not be eligible, they may very well be. Thanks, Chris. Um, we're going to go back to um, our online questions. This is actually a, a good segue. The question from Eric, who um, somewhere in Maine did not give us a town, um, asks, what are banks doing to help? Besides giving loans, can they defer loans for a few months, then just add it on the other end? That's a question from Eric. Happy to answer that question. Um, all lenders have a tremendous number of tools that they can work with customers. Um, deferment is an option. There's an interest-only option. And I should add, in this particular environment, uh, with all of the difficulties around us economically, we have historically low interest rates. Um, and as Amy pointed out, the 1% rate for the PPP program also is reflected in very low mortgage rates. So we have found, as people have reached out to their lender, describe their circumstance, and I would urge that no, there's not a one-size-fits-all, but there is ample room and all institutions are willing to talk about how to work with their customers uh, to make a success story um, out of where they are financially right now. Um, again, though, it takes communication, so reaching out before they're in uh, difficulty or as they become fearful of where they're headed, um, that's the best advice that we can pass along. This is uh, Todd, and if I may just add on to what Chris said. Um, these, uh, the, the Triple P program, uh, the IDLE program, uh, they are incredible tools to have uh, in our toolbox and, and to provide uh, to our small businesses around the state, and we're very thankful to, to have them. Uh, but there are many, many tools uh, in that toolbox that our credit unions and our banks can pull out. And as Chris said, uh, it starts with a conversation. And whether it's a, a payment deferral, it's a forbearance, which is restructuring a loan, um, whatever it might be, um, it starts with that conversation. And in working with, uh, talking with our credit unions today, um, we learned that 100% of them are providing some form of uh, assistance, some, some form of, of assistance or relief um, across the board, and they're all doing it. They're all unique. They're all doing it a little bit differently, uh, but they're all there to help in some form. Thank you. We'll go now to uh, Genevieve. Genevieve, go ahead. Hello. Thank you for putting this call together. I appreciate it. I saw a commercial fishing boat captain in Stonington, and I'm looking at the PPP loan and it says 75% of the loan is forgivable but has to be used for payroll costs. My largest expense is my boat payment. What is considered a payroll cost, or would that be considered the equivalent to a mortgage if I was a on land business? So why the PPP program can be used for other purposes, but what you might want to think about is first, definitely have a conversation with the, the mortgage holder or ship mortgage holder on your boat and see if there is something they can do with payment relief from their side. Um, but also, the economic injury disaster loan is really designed to help with working capital needs. And one of the purposes for that loan would be to um, make payments on another loan. So you could technically you know, utilize the funds from the economic injury disaster loan to make those payments now and in the future. Um, those loans really look forward for a period of time. It could be six or nine months to see how long it might take for a business to recover. And in that way, you could utilize that loan program for that 
and again, I the interest rate on that is fixed at 3.75%, and the term of those economic injury disaster loans can be up to 30 years. So those can be, um, you know, we're hearing that they're putting all of them at 30 years. So those can be a very affordable option to sort of help give that payment relief as well. And I also wanted to add that another benefit uh, under the CARES Act was if someone has an existing SBA loan, either a guaranteed loan through a bank or credit union, a 504 loan or a microloan, there was funding in that act that the agency will be making payments on behalf of the borrowers for six months. Um, with all the talk about PPP, we haven't had the time to get that out, and I know they're working on the details, but that's a huge benefit for anybody who has an existing SBA loan uh, at this time as well. Thank you very much. I also want to uh, break in real quick because I, I, I recognize that voice uh, and name. And, of course, Genevieve uh, didn't identify herself as a state representative, Genevieve McDonald, uh, also a lobster boat captain her, herself, uh, but uh, couldn't let you get away uh, without <laughs> identifying yourself uh, as uh, on this call, no doubt, uh, with questions on, on behalf of the entire uh, lobster community in Stonington. So. Thank you for the work you've been doing in the state legislature. I know you also uh, passed some uh, emergency legislation in, in response to this for the communities, and I, I have no doubt you're doing a lot of constituent services for the, for the lobster men uh, in the entire community right now. Thank you very much, and thank you again for putting together this call. This information is very valuable just to myself and also to my constituents in this district. Thank you. We're going to go now to an online question, but first I want to remind folks who are just joining us that if you have a question, we'd love to hear from you. Please dial star three on your phone at any time to ask your question. Um, we're now going to go to Louise from Bethel, who asks, what is the state chamber doing to get information out to local chambers about resources available to businesses through state and federal programs? That's Louise from Bethel. Well, Louise, uh, thanks for the um, question. Actually, we have been working in strong relationship uh, with local and regional chambers. We uh, meet with them uh, twice a week uh, to talk about current issues. We have a website that that is updated daily. Uh, our impact, which is our newsletter, goes out in the evening um, and is part of the local chamber review as well as the news clips in the morning. There is an abundance of, of work that we do and everything we do, we uh, do as a family. So you could go to our website that connects you to a local site, uh, but our whole purpose is, and, and you spoke to it at the outset in your question, which was uh, to get the information with something as significant as both the challenge and the opportunity that comes with these loans and the opportunities that come with them, that it's important for us to get that information out, to share the resources that are available, to be able to not necessarily answer the questions, uh, but to find the experts who can answer the questions. Uh, and you certainly have heard uh, three of them on this program this evening uh, with our two bankers um, and with Amy and certainly uh, Congressional uh, Congressman Golden has been front and center serving on the small business community in, in Congress, but also being there for us all the time. So I think there's a real family effort, and you could go to any of our chambers and connect with any other one. That's how close we have come together to try to get the information out. Thank you. We're going to go now to an online question from Charlie in Farmington. Charlie asks, with the PPP loan forgiveness, are lenders being proactive in advising borrowers to withhold payroll tax in their calculations, being conservative on their payroll costs? don't know that a lender would advise that. Um, honestly, what I've been hearing, and I don't know that this is lenders advising them, but I think this is just sort of what folks think is that, so a, an eligible business gets one shot at this. You, there's only one 
PPP loan per small business. So I think a lot may be thinking, find a way to maximize what they can apply for because you know you can always decrease the loan like and take less. Um, and then, you know, maybe work with the numbers and the percentages to maximize your loan forgiveness piece as well. So there is, um, I was on a webinar this morning and it has been clarified that I believe it's certain taxes aren't eligible to be included in those payroll taxes. Um, and don't quote me on this, and I shouldn't say this because I am being quoted, but um, I believe it's the federal income tax portion that may not be able to be included in the PPP payroll costs. Amy, uh, this is Chris Pinkham. I think you are accurate, but I would refer Charlie to the SBA website because there are new FAQs that were posted about midday today, and I'm fairly sure that some of this was covered um, in one of the questions. Thanks, you both. We're going to go to another online question. Uh, this one is from John. John asks, uh, I own a building with a restaurant as a tenant. Should I seek funding to cover the lack of rent, or is that the responsibility of the tenant to get funding and keep up with the monthly rent payments? That's a question from John. So Didn't know I wrote, oh, go ahead. Right. Amy, I, I was just going to, um, if, you, if, if you have a response for this, I was going to say, I, I might have a partial one, but I'd be interested to hear uh, what you have to say first. Sure. So I guess it would, um, you know, depend on what that connection is. It, it sounds like they're um, not related parties, like someone is truly leasing the building to someone else. Um, so that's certainly the scenario that I, I think was being referred to here. Um, you know, before all these loan options and things started to become available, we were having conversations about two people who were either landlords or um, lenders or whatever and saying, you know, I think we all need to sort of pitch in here and see what we can do to help these small businesses. So certainly I would hope that landlords, if they can at all possibly, would consider, you know, finding a way to work with the um, tenant, but um, there is a way through the Economic Injury Disaster Loan that um, those types of expenses may potentially be eligible for that loan. That's pretty much what I was going to say, Amy, so thank you. No problem. Thank you. We're going to go now to um, an online question from Chris in, Hol in Holton. He says, I applied for the EIBL and advance grant over a week ago. When will I get that approval and the advance? That's Chris from Holton. Yes, that is a frequent question that I hear and my staff hears. Um, we are, have been told that they are working through a, a large queue and that um, there um, is a way through the website that um, folks can follow up on that status. Um, but I feel free to reach out to our office. Um, our direct line is 622-8551. And we will have somebody connect you with the customer service folks at the Disaster Center to try to get a handle on where that stands. I know a lot of people have been waiting um, and we are told that they're working through a significant backlog, but um, we're happy to try to follow up and help you out determining where that stands. Great, thank you. As we um, get close to the end here, I wanna remind folks if you joined us recently that if you'd like to ask a question, please dial star three and um, we'll be sure to get you on the air. Um, we'll go now to another one of our online questions. This one is from Leanne. She asks, how difficult will it be to prove you have met the criteria for the loan to be forgiven? That's Leanne.
So um, I guess that's back in my space. But um, what we are, again, as things have been fine-tuned, and thank you very much, Chris, for letting me know there's a new FAQ on the SBA website. I've been so busy and in my emails and on the phone so much I hadn't checked the website. Um, so that just goes to tell you how quickly things are developing and how quickly they're trying to roll out some of the clarification. So as we get move forward, we hope we will have very clear guidance on uh, to our lenders so that they can close these loans in compliance with us as well as you know clearly convey to the borrower what needs to be done to meet the criteria. But the advice I would give would be if you're making expenditures with those funds, clearly retain the documents uh, that support what you've spent that money on. And again, you're going to want to document that it was used to make payroll payments to the best that, of your ability to maximize the forgiveness. So whatever way you do your payroll, whether it's a payroll service or whether you do it yourself, those kind of bank documents and IRS documents are going to be critical uh, to support those disbursements to support the forgiveness component. Great. Thank you, Director Bassett. Um, we'll go to John here. John asks, I don't think this pandemic will be over in eight weeks, which is how long a PPP loan is supposed to last an employer. What are the chances a Part 4 stimulus bill will extend the program? That's a question from John. Well, I'll I'll take this one um, since it's uh, more in the uh, legislative uh, side of things. Um, you know, I think that it's totally appropriate to wonder uh, just how long the virus will be with us, uh, and how long we might see some of these, um, you know, orders uh, at the state level uh, that are very restrictive to um, businesses um, and causing a lot of this economic damage. Uh, but also just people's general anxieties and fears uh, about going out uh, and shopping, uh, about being out uh, in public and getting back to uh, normalcy, even when we get uh, a green light uh, from uh, public health experts, I think it is going to be uh, difficult at first for many businesses, um, you know, th both those that have been continued uh, to be open, but also those that have been shut down uh, by by um, government orders because they weren't deemed essential. So I, I think you're completely right to wonder, um, you know, whether or not eight weeks is, is enough. And earlier in, in the call, I talked about how I had concerns, not only that the original sum of money wasn't enough, uh, but also that the $250 billion that's being talked about uh, to supplement that uh, may not go far enough. And it's really out of recognition of what you said, which is that there are so many unknowns about how long it will take us uh, to address the, the virus and get to a place where we can open our economy back up. Uh, and so I really think what we need is for Congress to remain flexible uh, and really be communicating with uh, groups like uh, like the Chamber of Commerce, with our lenders, uh, with our local chambers, with business owners directly, uh, our constituents, and, and also getting feedback from the Small Business Administration so that we see in advance what kind of action we might need to take uh, with this program to keep it going if necessary. I think everyone wants to get back uh, to an environment where businesses can just start operating uh, and, and hopefully start recovering uh, from the economic damage as quickly as possible, and we'll be there to assist you with that. But um, let me just say I, the current discussions uh, for the other uh, additional $250 billion, really not looking to make a whole lot of changes to the program. Uh, other than to perhaps uh, bring in some more potential eligible lenders, uh, groups like CEI, uh, for an example. Uh, however, uh, I think that as part of follow-on legislation that may continue to be negotiated beyond, you know, this week, uh, this week's actions, uh, we hope uh, that will take place this week. Uh, but even if it, if it does uh, or doesn't, uh, negotiations on a fourth bill are, are very much active, uh, and I think that's where we might uh, see Congress reacting to what we're seeing on the ground. So possible that we might, you know, Director Bassett just said an eligible business only gets one shot at this. Uh, that may be true today, uh, but if we have um, feedback that says that we need to make changes, perhaps we will open up a, another round of eligibility. Uh, and so I think 
it's not really um, giving you reassurances or any promises other than to say that I'm thinking about that just the same as you are, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that in Congress. Uh, and, and continue to, to reach out and all of you, uh, all businesses, uh, share what you're experiencing on the ground. Certainly we're aware of, of what kind of orders we're getting uh, from the governor's administration about what businesses can and can't do. Uh, and so we'll have some sense of, of whether or not we need to extend that eight-week program. Thanks, Congressman. We're going to go now to Betty in Skowhegan. Betty, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, I had a business ask me whether they'd be eligible or not because they were closed for the winter while they were remodeling and planned on opening April 1st. Representative Betty and Austin from Skowhegan, thank you for, for calling in. And uh, uh, I'm not surprised that, that you're doing so on behalf of a constituent. I appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure uh, who would be best for fielding this question, but if anyone wants to jump in. So we had this question come up a lot. Um, a lot of Maine businesses are seasonal, and so one of the criteria for the program is that the business had to have been in operation as of February 15th, 2020, and I think that caused some confusion initially. Um, because while a seasonal business, their doors may not have been open, they are still technically in operation. Uh, they just hadn't opened for the season. So that wasn't a problem from the eligibility perspective. And knowing that this loan amount is looking at past payroll records, and there's some specific parameters on that time frame, uh, and again, knowing that seasonal businesses may not have been open, um, it actually allows those types of businesses to look back to the prior year um, and gives a window of opportunity for them to look at that payroll data in order to determine the eligibility. So it certainly is still something that they should consider. Amy, uh, this is Chris Pinkham, and um, for the caller, um, reading from the most recently released FAQs, uh, regarding seasonal business activity, it does permit a the lender may consider whether a seasonal borrower was in operation on February 15th, as you stated, or for an eight-week period between February 15th, 2019, and June 30, 2019. So I think um, we had hoped for an option for that calculation, and I think again, if people were to look at the FAQs on the sba.gov site, uh, that may give them some clarity. Thank you. We'll go now to a online question from Charles. Charles asks, as a lobster fisherman and sole proprietor of my business, I'm concerned the value of this year's cash will be historically low should I preemptively apply for relief now or wait to see what the seasons bring? That's from Charles. A good question, Charles. Um, uh, earlier, uh, Director Bassett uh, and I had a, an exchange to one of the, the first questions we received uh, about the EIDL uh, program, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. Um, and uh, I think we discussed that there was uh, you know, people could apply for that loan and then uh, wait uh, up to, I think the director said, six months uh, before deciding whether or not to use it. So that may be an option that you could apply for the loan now, wait and see if you got approved. But having been approved, you could wait and see how the season went because uh, I'm sure you're looking to avoid taking on uh, debt unless uh, additional debt unless that were necessary. But uh, does anyone else want to weigh in on the panel as well? Sure, I would add that, um, you, yeah, the economic injury disaster loan, technically the application filing date is all the way out till December 16th. So there is definitely still time there. Um, but as the Congressman said, we have been advising a lot of people, um, and I, I know a banker would do this too, and a, a um, lender at a credit union, they advise uh, businesses to think ahead and put pieces in place in case things happen. So 
you may want to explore your options to ensure that you'll have access to capital if you need it, should it not uh, work out well. Thank you. We're going to go now to Denise from Dover Foxcraft. Go ahead, Denise. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking this call um, and, and, and speaking with all of us tonight. Um, I have come across a really helpful worksheet um, on the SBA website to help employers determine uh, kind of the formula to uh, how, you know, how to work out the forgivable piece um, and the actual payroll portion of the loan that they take. So I would encourage everyone to look for that worksheet. Um, my question is, uh, as far as an employer who has applied for the PPP, has been approved, has not yet received the money, and is trying to determine, especially as a non-essential business, when the timing would be right to bring the employees back, um, when does that eight-week period begin for them? So once they're approved, um, I'm assuming they'll take, it'll take a little while for them to actually receive the funds. Do they, does that eight-week period begin at approval? Does it begin when they receive the funds? Can they wait and begin the eight-week the eight period later on? And is there an expiration date to that eight-week period? Uh, or, you know, a date they have to use that, those funds for payroll by? I think I'll let Amy answer the second part of the question, but there has been a change in the first part of the question. Um, recently, when the program launched, there was a five-day window for loans to be dispersed after approval was received. Um, as of today, that was increased to 10 days. So I'll let Amy take the second part of the question about uh, dispersal during the eight-week period. Thank you. And yes, that was um, extended so that the lenders had a little bit longer time to get the documentation together and get the funds out. Um, and again, remember what the intent of this program was. It was get to get immediate cash paying payroll. So it was built into the bill uh, that these um, time frames are there, but that eight week period kicks off not at approval but at the time that the loan is dispersed by the bank. So that eight week period begins when the bank disperses a loan and puts the funds into the business's checking account. Thank you. Um, this is going to be our last question of the evening. Um, and I want to remind folks that at the end of the call, if they stay on the line, you'll have the opportunity to leave us a message, and we will be sure to get back to you with a response from the congressman's office promptly. Um, all you have to do is stay on the line after the call is done. We'll go to our last question, which is from Toby in Bucksport. Toby asks, my bank isn't participating in the PPP, but when I try to get a PPP loan from another bank, they tell me that they won't be able to help me because I don't have an existing relationship with them. Why is that? That's Toby from Bucksport. Well, Thanks. that's this is Chris Pinkham from the Maine Bankers Association responding to that question. Um, I understand that that is a frustration. Um, banks and credit unions are regulated both at the state and federal level, and one of the requirements that we have to adhere to um, is the BSA Act, which is the Know Your Customer Law. Um, because of that, people who we already have an existing relationship with are in our system. We have done our due diligence to meet the compliance requirements that the regulations have in place. Um, that work would have to be done for a new customer uh, from the start. It's a process. Uh, it does take a window of time, and I think most lenders felt they had an obligation to their existing customers to work with them first. Having said that, I am certainly aware that there are institutions who, once they get through the backlog, will be willing to take applications um, from non-customers who want to start that relationship. All I can really advise is for people to have patience. The flood of applicants in the first five or six days has been just astronomical. And as we've worked our way through with all the guidance of the SBA information that was available, some of which has been revised, 
and through Amy's staff in the district office, I think we're making progress. I think we're getting ahead of it. Now that the rules have been finalized for closing the loans, cash will be dis um, distributed. Um, and as I reported earlier on, we've actually had at least reported to us the initial uh, loan made. But I think uh, there's good news ahead. And I believe there will be institutions that will make uh, funds available to current non-customers who would become customers. Toby, thanks for the question. This is Congressman Golden. Um, and uh, Chris, thank you for the answer. And I'm sure uh, Todd would have said the same. Uh, and I'm sure they would both uh, encourage you to continue to reach out to uh, institutions because, like Chris said, uh, once they are through uh, the applications with their existing clients, I'm sure someone is going to want to work with you. And, and on the congressional side, uh, you know, I, I remain committed to trying to make sure that we have enough funds available uh, for for all of the demand that's out there from small business owners. And I just want to say politically, there's been some discussion about whether or not lenders uh, should receive some kind of signal from uh, from you know the federal government, uh, from regulators, or, or from Congress that they won't be held liable for any funds that were dispersed uh, to a fraudulent uh, uh, application. And, and I just you know we have a to balance the the desire to get money out to people like yourself and business owners as quickly as possible with protecting you as taxpayers and not wanting to see your money uh, go to waste, fraud, or abuse, uh, which is why. Uh, that requirement is there for for banks to to know their lenders, and so you know it has been something that's been discussed. Should we uh, try and speed up the the process uh, because people like you need help as quickly as possible? But also we're, we we recognize that we have an obligation uh, to make sure that none of, none of your tax dollars are are going to uh, fraudulent uh, applications. And you know sadly there are people like like that out there. Um, so it's a, it's a tough question, but I think we're, we're trying to find the right balance. Thanks, Congressman. Uh, we're going to kick it back to you to uh, close out the call here. Well, I just want to thank everyone uh, for being on the line, for calling in, for, for your patience, um, and, and for your commitment uh, to, to your communities, to your business, and, and to the people that work for you. I, um, can't say enough uh, how very badly I feel about the situation that you all find yourselves in and, and want to do everything I can to help. Uh, I want to thank uh, everyone uh, for joining us tonight, Director Bassett. Um, you know, I, I just can't uh, thank you enough. I'm sure you've had a, a long day uh, for many days now, uh, and you're going to continue to, to have them. And, and so taking the time in the evening to connect with uh, business owners here in Maine and answer their questions uh, is of great value and I appreciate it. And thank you as well to Chris and Todd from our, our lending organizations. Uh, we, we really appreciate your taking the time and the work that all of the branches out there are doing and, and their employees. I've heard stories about lenders uh, who were working all weekend, uh, even on uh, Sunday, uh, trying to be as responsive to business owners as possible. So my thanks extended. Uh, not only to the the banks, uh, but also to their staff uh, on behalf of my constituents here in, in Maine. And, and Dana, thank you as well to all the efforts that the Chamber of Commerce is putting forward uh, and will put forward, uh, I think, you know, going forward as we work through uh, the economic fallout from the coronavirus. I do want to uh, point out to people still on the call, uh, if you have questions, please go look up my office. Uh, you can go to golden.house.gov. Uh, we have information up there about all of these programs as well as other resources like small business development centers that can help. Uh, we also have set up uh, a small business response team, uh, members of my staff dedicated to working to help connect you with uh, these resources at SBA or, or connect you with SBDCs or other, uh, trying to answer other questions you may have. And you can um, call our office or you can email small biz. That's B I Z, small biz response team at mail.house.gov, and we will get back to you as quickly as we can. Um, we also have a small business resource guide up on our website, similar to uh, the one you would find at sba.gov. Uh, we'll be having another listening session tomorrow at the same time. If you want to listen, perhaps a different question will get asked, or, or we'll have some update uh, that the SBA has received uh, you know, over 24 hours. So things are constantly changing. and. We're getting more and more guidance. So uh, if you want to listen again, uh, just call the same number you did tonight. 
uh, or visit golden.house.gov forward slash live. Uh, and thanks again so much uh, to all of our participants. Uh, Kent, I cannot thank you enough for all the effort.